Thank you for inviting me to uh, this session of the Great Decision Series and uh, to be your discussant uh, on the issue of the Middle East Awakening, something that uh, I'm a little bit familiar with, as you can tell from my biography. Uh, in fact, I entitled this uh, session that I'm going to have with you Three Generations of Revolution and Reawakening, because in fact, that's what they are. Uh, what are we really witnessing in the Middle East today? Uh, the Arabs are in revolt in the streets. Uh, a number of regimes are trying desperately to hold on to power. Some are succeeding. Some are buckling under. Uh, and then there are some parts of the Middle East where this Middle East awakening isn't occurring at all. And I'd like to know why on all three of those counts, and we'll talk a little bit about that. We also want to know what in the world is coming next. Uh, and what should the United States do about it, if anything? And we'll look at all of those things. Uh, I would say that off the bat, uh, energy and turmoil in the Middle East is really nothing new. And that's why I entitle this Three Generations of the Revolution, because there have been three generations of popular attempts to change the status quo. And each time, those attempts have been under different leaderships to try to uh, gather the popular sentiment and each time those leaders have, in fact, betrayed their people. And this is the third in a series, and we'll look more closely at it. The bottom line for me in this third generation is that if it is to succeed, it needs to uh, have the popular fervor be channeled in a direction toward the development of civil society, which means that the rule of law needs to be created and needs to be created in a way that people see it as being legitimate for that country. There needs to be open participation, transparency, and accountability under that rule of law that they will have created. And these societies need to develop and to sustain institutions of civil society and good governance that will allow that open participation and transparency. Sounds all very good. Is it possible? We shall see. We will examine each of the previous two efforts and compare them to today's events. And as your guide, uh, having spent 34 of the past 60 years uh, in this region, uh, I can help navigate the, the waters of uncertainty that you may have. So, before we begin to go down memory lane, let me ask you if you were in the shoes of uh, people in the street in the Middle East, what would be your grievances? What are some of the demands that you are clamoring for? Jobs. Jobs. Jobs and growth. What else would you be looking for? What else are you clamoring for that you're not getting today? Safety on the streets. Security. Security. What else might you be looking for? <clears throat> you don't like corruption. What else do you need and you can't get under some of these governments? Women's issues. Women's issues, and what might that be? What, what are some of the really important women's issues? The need to drive. <laughs> <laughs> Which, if you expand that out, what are we talking about for women? Oh, <laughs> oh, not all at once. Autonomy, Autonomy freedom. Freedom, independence, property. <laughs> there are a couple of words, education, there are a couple of words that you actually hear on the street all the time and that you read in the newspapers, and those are the questions of dignity and justice. Those are really two very important causes 
that people are yearning for. Well, all of this sounds very good. These are very appropriate things to be fighting for. These are very reasonable demands, and other nations and other times have successfully achieved uh, all of these things. Now, what is standing in the way of the achievement of these? Who, who or what is standing in the way of achieving these things? What has, what has been their, what, what is the obstacle to them? Their government, which is usually a, well, as we say, a corrupt government. Sometimes it's a military government. And the corrupt regimes. Um, So we see that uh, these repressive regimes, military regimes, corrupt regimes, are what is standing in the way of the people today in achieving uh, their grievance, the solution to their grievances. Well, these. Well, that's an interesting question, and let's look at the question of. Let's put it up because the question of religion is very important. We'll talk about religion in a minute. Um, These grievances mirror those grievances that occurred back in the first two generations. Self-determination, civil rights, freedom, economic growth, economic justice. And the reasons that these are still around, these demands are still around, is that the promises made in the first place never really materialized. They were never delivered. So, let's rewind the movie back 60 years to the 1950s, uh, an era that certainly, uh, as adults, my parents experienced. They might remember what went on in this part of the world in the 1950s. There were political and social forces that were coursing through the streets in much of the Middle East, resulting in upheaval and strife There were regimes collapsing left and right under violence and fire. Uncertainty, instability reigned in this region in the 1950s. Some of this sounds familiar, and for a good reason. But there was one really different ingredient at the time that's important to all of us, and that was the United States, America, was not the predominant power in the region. The United States was not under fire. Great Britain was, and to some extent, France. But that had been the state of affairs really since the end of World War I and certainly since the fall of the Ottoman Empire. In the first half of that 20th century, the world witnessed two important movements arise, Arab nationalism and the Islamic revival. We'll talk about religion. And these movements challenged the colonial and secular regimes that were in charge at the time. In the 1920s and 1930s, a number of popular movements sprang up. Zionism, the Muslim Brotherhood, the quest for a Palestinian state, among other things. After World War II, these political theories took to the streets. The British, pretty quickly after World War II, surrendered Palestine, gave the mandate back to the United Nations. The Zionists created Israel, created the state of Israel, pretty much right after World War II in 1948. And fervor began to grow in Iran, Iraq, Egypt, against British domination, against the rulers that the British maintained in those countries, and of course against Israel as a symbol of the legacy of colonial power as the Arabs saw it. But those rulers that the British maintained in power were particularly problematic for the people who were seeking uh, Arab nationalism and independence. You might remember who some of those rulers were in the 1950s. Who was the ruler in Iran? Does anyone remember? The Shah of Iran. How about Egypt? Who was ruling Egypt in the 1950s and 40s? 
before Nasser and Nagib, who was the ruler? King Farouk, supported by the British. How about Iraq? Does anyone remember who was the monarch in Iraq? Ah. His name was King Faisal. Absolutely. Cousin of the king and part of a dynasty that had ruled that region for centuries. So now the British Empire is vanishing. But London is trying to find some way, some, they are debating how can they maintain their reputation, their influence, and of course their strategic economic interests in this part of the world. Huge debate inside of London. That might sound familiar to you too. Here we are in the 1950s. The UK's role and its influence is beginning to fragment. And what happens? The Iranian government nationalizes the Anglo-Persian oil company, an important uh, um, uh, British influence in, uh, and, and British uh, institution in Iran in 1951. Then the Egyptian military conducted the coup against King Farouk in 1952. And they also, a little bit later, nationalized the Suez Canal and also the area that the British used to set up their military garrison in Egypt, nationalized by the military government. So in response to this growing instability, what did the British do? They began to concentrate and consolidate their military, um, uh, their military um, units in Cyprus, in Iraq, in the Persian Gulf, and down here in the protectorate, the den then protectorate uh, of Aden, in the port of Aden. They needed something to shore up their influence and power in the region through military presence. And then came the Iraqi mil military coup. There goes Iraq in 1958. A Yemeni military coup in 1962 against the then king in, 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 uh, in Yemen. Now the, the United Kingdom is really getting anxious about this Arab nationalism and the threat to its interests. The United States at this time in the 1950s shared British concerns about the stability of the region, but for different reasons. Our concern was that of Moscow and the Soviet Union. That's what we were worried about. Arab nationalism, we were not too exercised about that. In fact, Arab nationalism to Americans seemed kind of legitimate. Um, overthrowing the British crown in favor of independence, well, yes, that sounds like something we could subscribe to. And in fact, the United States at this time in the 1950s was pretty critical of British imperialist policy and what we saw as a British colonial attitude in the Middle East, helping to perhaps cause some of these problems to begin with. But we were still very concerned about the Soviet inroads into this area. So in the first generation of this uh, revolt in the 1950s and 60s, Arab nationalism began to grow, demanding self-governance, demanding control over the sources of wealth in their country, and that was predominantly oil, but also territory, important geostrategic locations like this Suez Canal, and like this area right here at the other end of the Red Sea, these were important pieces of territory that Arab nations wanted to maintain control over. <clears throat> and of course, the Arabs were uh, very much opposed to continuing colonial domination and exploitation. These were all things that had been promised by the British and the French during and after World War I and were never realized. So a new narrative dominated the Arab street, infecting their education systems, their political systems, their political rhetoric, their radio announcements, and those were wounded pride and dignity, injustice, repression, betrayal, conspiracy, impotence, and even fatalism. There's just nothing we can do about this. Some of that may all sound familiar. The rejection of this colonial dominance surged in the 1960s. I told you about Egypt, Iraq, and Yemen, but then it continued uh, in, in Lebanon, in Syria, and Algeria. In fact, I would recommend to you a movie 
that was issued in 1966. It's a French movie called The Battle of Algiers, and it was directed by an Italian director, Gilles Pontecorvo. But this movie gives you a very moving and realistic understanding of the, fee pe the feelings of the uh, people on the Arab street about their own injustices, about their uh, colonial rulers in the French, and the relationships between the two of them, and why terrorism grew in Algeria. Very interesting film. I highly recommend it. So where is Islamism, or political Islam, in all of this? Well, as I mentioned to you before, the Muslim Brotherhood grew up in <clears throat> 1928. And there were also a number of very well-known Islamic theologians and political theorists that began to sustain these currents of Islamic ideology and Islamic political thought. But they were very much in competition with this secular Arab na nationalism, and so it never really went viral, as they say, but it never really disappeared either. And what happened to the promise of Arab nationalism in that period of time? What happened to justice? What happened to economic prosperity? What happened to freedom from domination? None of it ever materialized. Instead, the Arab nationalist ideology really just shrunk to uh, a few bumper sticker slogans that Arab leaders can throw out from time to time. And the reality was these despotic and autocratic rulers that were running these countries used the ideology used the popular anger and frustration in order to stay in power. And stay in power they did. But they did nothing to achieve any of these goals. All of those regimes suppressed Islamic ideology and, and the Islamic political movements. And they also suppressed any liberal or conservative movements around at the same time that would challenge them, including, for example, any monarchist movements uh, that wanted to return to monarchies. None of that was going to happen. Now in the 1970s, the second generation was born. The Arabs still frustrated with all of these nationalist slogans that never went anywhere. In 1971, the British finally withdrew all of their forces from what they called East of Suez whole area east of Suez. And this was under the British Labor government that never really liked the colonial period anyway. And the British Labor government realized that all of this was costing Britain a lot of money and they just could not justify it. So the British withdrew pretty suddenly. That was, by the way, one of the causes of the creation of the United Arab Emirates. And we can talk about that later if you like. So new movements arose in this second generation. The rise of Palestinian radicalism, the growth of the PLO, terrorism as a tactic, and then other movements even more radical than that, Islamic Jihad and the Abu Nidal group, they all grew up in this period of time. Then in 1976, the Lebanese Civil War exploded. The Lebanese Civil War is kind of unique and emblematic at the same time. It's unique because, frankly, Lebanon is just a unique country. And it is emblematic because the Lebanese Civil War contained nearly every single symptom that we've talked about up till now. The colonial legacy, nationalist rivalries, Palestinians and Israelis, foreign manipulation, and the faded memories of a really glorious Lebanese past. It was at this time that I joined the Foreign Service with my wife Beatrice. And in 1974, when we joined, we went to a number of places in this particular area, as was mentioned in the bio. Afghanistan, Syria, the Persian Gulf, all of locations where uh, nationalist fervor was beginning to grow. United States policy began to replace the British that had left so that the United States presence and influence gradually expanded in the 1970s and 80s to Saudi Arabia, to Egypt, to the United Arab Emirates and Qatar and Bahrain, 
and Jordan, Jordan is here, among a number of other places. And in fact, the United States in the 19, late 1980s even grow, grew closer to Syria and Lebanon. That was at a time, our second uh, assignment at the U.S. Embassy in Damascus, when the United States, Syria, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, Israel, all worked to create what was called the Taif Accords, the agreements that ended formally once and for all the Lebanese Civil War. Those were actually pretty good times. United States soft power, as they call it, was on the rise. We were a vital force that theoretically could bring justice in this region, but it never did. Uh, we could bring respect for rights, but it never did. We could bring economic prosperity to those countries not blessed with oil, but it only worked out for some. In fact, too many argued that it was uh, American foreign investment and American um, economic assistance that supported these despots, while most of the citizens were living in poverty or at least were at the mercy of those corrupt officials that we talked about. So on the one hand, we were admired for our vitality as a, domestic, as a democratic society, and on the other, we were criticized for hypocrisy. We were accused of manipulating events against the will of the people. We were accused of providing the military assistance that kept these autocrats in power. And most importantly, we were condemned for being anti-Muslim. So once again, the Arab and Muslim populations of the Middle East are frustrated, impotent, and felt betrayed. And this was the state of affairs in 1979. And new watershed upheavals occurred, which rocked the Islamic world and now launched a political space for the ascendance of Islamism or political Islam as a counterweight to that secular nationalism that had uh, arisen in the first generation. What happened? The Iranian Revolution, the takeover of the U.S. Embassy and the capture of, of hostages, the takeover of the Grand Mosque in Mecca by a, a group of wild fanatic Islamists, and because the rumor spread rapidly around the Middle East after that takeover of the Grand Mosque that the United States had defiled the mosque, people in the streets were up in arms against the United States on the basis of a rumor. And in fact, popular mobs in Islamabad, Pakistan, burned the U.S. Embassy in Islamabad to the ground. So in the 1980s, it was the Islamists who began to criticize and to fight these old regimes and, and, and of course, fought the United States and, and Israel in the name of, of Islam. Now, it's important to keep in mind that all Arab nations are predominantly Muslim. Most of them have very devout populations, and they practice their faith uh, religiously, faithfully, um, devoutly. Uh, Islam as a political force, however, is predominant in two countries, and that would be Saudi Arabia and Iran. But in the second generation, the Arab regimes devoted way too much time and effort and resources to fighting against political Islam and fighting against terrorism and not enough time in addressing any of these grievances. But Islamism, too, failed to answer these grievances. And for most Arabs and other Muslims, Islamism seemed only to be the road to more violence and more destruction. No justice, no development, no dignity. Well, this stew finally boiled over in 2011. The Arab awakening was the third generation of revolt. The, within the collective unconscious of these protesters of today, were the same narratives that we've heard all along. Unfulfilled rights, stunted economic and social growth, and a legacy of military dictators and despots that had taken over from monarchical dictators and despots. Foreign regimes were still around, manipulating their de destinies against their will. They had mixed feelings in the street still about the United States. Are we a source of good or are we a source of evil?
And lurking alongside was the force of Islam and Islamism. Is political Islam a force of good or is it a force of evil? Some said one of each. But what is it that changed in this third generation? Well, it wasn't uh, Islamic leaders and it wasn't military leaders, but it was the people of the street that decided to get the courage and the determination to take matters in their own hands. And they were able to organize virtually through the internet rather than being afraid to assemble in somebody's basement or in some dark alley where they would, could be victims of repression and reprisal. They could go out into the street together after they had worked together over the internet and the only vulnerability they had was as a large group, mass demonstrations, and any way they knew that all of the world was watching. They were not abandoned and they were not forgotten. And they realized that unlike the resort to violence in the earlier generations, their demands were best realized if through a nonviolent means. This was a revelation to the people. They were able to remove dictators while actually moving toward the establishment of justice, dignity, and freedom. So let's take a look now at the status of some of these revolts. Where is the revolution succeeding? And by, by succeeding, I mean that a despised autocrat has been deposed and the people are moving toward participatory, participatory democracy. Well, we have Tunisia, which is just here on a sliver. Uh, actually, we can't see it because it's right next to Libya, so it's way off the, the chart here. Uh, we have Egypt. There's Libya, which is next to Egypt. We have Yemen down here, and arguably Iraq is a revolution that is succeeding. Autocratic dictator deposed and moving toward participatory democracy. Where is the revolution present but not succeeding? Well, as we see too horribly every day on television, Syria, to some extent Iran, and then many argue here in the island nation of Bahrain. We can talk about that if you like. So what have been the factors that led to the success of the revolution in the places where it succeeded? Well, first of all, the militaries did not side with the ruler, and that was the case in Tunisia and Egypt. Or the militaries were very deeply divided, and that was the case in Libya and, as we have seen, in Yemen. These successful protests enjoyed a significant amount of outside support and even outside uh, assistance, and there was unalloyed, unmitigated pressure on the regimes from the outside world. Conversely, the revolts seemed to be failing in Syria and Iran because of military solidarity with the regime, and even though there may be pressure on the regime, it is mitigated. There are some relief valves for the regime, and in the case of Syria and Iran, that has to do with uh, Russia and China and, and Iran itself um, giving uh, relief and support to Syria. There's Lebanon. Lebanon, right there on the coast. Well, arguably, Lebanon already went through its upheavals 20 years ago. And perhaps the arrangements made at the end of their civil war are working, even though it is rather fragile and there are forces that are trying to upset the Lebanese balance, as we have seen uh, over the course of the last eight or ten years. So the question remains, will the successful regimes succeed in this third generation to a more complete degree. Well, here is my recipe for their success, what I would advocate if they were asking me. The first thing is don't dwell on the past. There will be time for reckoning. There will be a time for settling of accounts. Not now. Secondly, what they really need to focus on is a broad consensus on the basic law of the nation, a constitution, if you will, 
but some foundation that everything else will be built upon. That needs to be done very, very quickly. Secondly, for those countries that would like to have parliamentary democracies or who already have parliamentary histories, they need to develop the institutions that allow democratic alternates. That is, some parties go into power, some parties come out of power, and they switch on and off. They will need a spectrum of political parties, not just one. And those political parties should not be based on sectarian beliefs or ethnic, uh, or, or, or ethnic uh, uh, composition. And they also need laws that will regulate the formation and the um, uh, the formation and the behavior of political parties, as well as the conduct of elections. And then finally, and perhaps more, more, most importantly, they need a free, unfettered media, and they need civil, uh, civil society, civic associations that keep an eye on, uh, on the government, keep an eye on what's going on in their country, so that people can be held accountable for their misdeeds. These nations need to build capacity in their basic institutions of government. And those institutions include ministries, agencies of government that perform the day-to-day -day operations of doing what governments do for their people. And that means basic functions like hiring and firing people, uh, having proper regulations for the carrying out of their, of their functions, supply, maintenance, a variety of different things. They need to be able to do that and many of these countries are not capable of doing that very well. Their, parliament needs improve, their parliaments need, need improvement in their structures and their committees, norms and regulations that, that, that uh, guide parliaments as to how they should uh, be comporting themselves and how they should be carrying on the business of the people. And then thirdly, the rule of law. Have institutions that we need to help those countries to develop in order for the rest to take place. The ability to engage in proper and humane policing and law enforcement. The creation of independent and effective judiciaries. And the creation of jails and prisons that are humane, but that also respond to the, uh, to the judicial uh, requirements of their system. Lastly, is the need for national reconciliation. I'm not talking about revenge or score settling, but reconciliation where ethnic or sectarian divisions threaten to undermine uh, societies and reignite violence. For example, in Egypt between Copts and Muslims. Or in Yemen, looks like things are going well there, but there is a, still a simmering re uh, revolt in the north uh, of the Al Houthi tribes, and there is still a simmering, very serious secession movement in the south. Those need to be dealt with. Iraq, Sunni, Kurds, Shia, Turkmen, Christians, uh, they need desperately a national reconciliation process. Uh, and arguably, this can be done. Lebanon found a way to bring together all of its mosaic fabric, all of the different uh, sects and ethnicities and religious be beliefs that exist in Lebanon. But they had uh, something that Iraq does not have, and that is help from its neighbors on the outside and help from other, other nations around the world. Well, the first thing I would say is the United States needs to be a bit more humble about its role and about what it can actually achieve in the Middle East. The Obama administration has improved our image tremendously, but uh, America still has a lot of baggage that it carries around in the eyes of the, uh, of the Arab people. Middle East citizens still resent and reject what the United States has done over the past 10 years in their, in their area. Our presence in the Middle East needs to be moderately and appropriately sized, something that uh, is sustainable by our uh, dwindling resources, but also to be present in a way where we are welcome and where we can be productive to help the people. How can we be productive? Firstly, we need to play an attractive role. This is the essence of soft power, to be attractive, not coercive.
We need to get out there and show our stuff, show what America is all about, not try to impose what we do or who we are on other people's psyches. And we know how to do that. We've been doing that for decades in the United States. Actually, back in that first and second generation, and when I was a Foreign Service officer, through our American libraries, American cultural centers, American visitor programs, American educational exchange programs, in order to promote concepts of open and transparent civil society to the people of the, of the Middle East, and also to give them an accurate perspective about who the United States really is, who we are as a people, and what our policies really stand for. We can actually, programmatically, help many people in the Middle East to build uh, capacity, to build infrastructure in their government, in their parliaments, for example, to bring parliamentarians here to the United States. I'm not sure that's a good idea these days, but <laughs> maybe in the future. Um, uh, but we actually have institutions here that can help educate uh, burgeoning parliaments about how to do their job. When we were in the African country of Niger, which is out in West Africa, the uh, military dictatorship there came to the U.S. Embassy and asked all of the foreign diplomatic uh, corps if we would help them to create a multi-party democracy in their country. Well, we all signed up to that. The United States, France, Canada, Belgium, the United Nations, the World Bank. We brought in a number of associations from um, the, uh, from the United States, including that much maligned National Democratic Institute. Uh, we did not have the uh, International Republican Institute. Uh, the NDI was actually more active in that part of Africa at the time. Decades long. And the people will ultimately remove di dictators in favor of freedom and dignity and justice. And what they need is a strong concurrence on the rule of law, and a basic constitution that everyone agrees to. They need strong institutions, and they need, most importantly, to foster open participation in their society by men and women, transparency in all of the, the public processes, whether in the economy, the, the political sphere, or in their society, and then finally, accountability to bring people who are uh, uh, flouting the law or who are going against the law to be made accountable under the rule of law. And with that, I believe that that third generation could actually succeed where the other two have failed. I thank you very much for your time, and let us see if there are some questions you may have.